Okay, good. Um, so I'm Jaya Tripathi, and I am a principal scientist at the MITRE Corporation here in Bedford, Massachusetts. Next, please. Um, just a, a line about MITRE. So MITRE works in the public interest, and we um, operate several FFRDCs, federally funded research and development centers. So one of the programs we have is an internal research program that fosters creativity. It's called the Innovation Program. And um, the work that I've been doing for the last seven or eight years was funded by this research program, the Innovation Program. Next, please. Just a couple of quotes on data, because that's what I do. I'm a data scientist that I really like. One, without data, you're just um, another person with an opinion. I don't see the slides here. That's okay. Um, you're just uh, another person with an opinion. There's another one that I like. Uh, next, please, from... So th this is um, from Sherlock Holmes, a study in Scarlet from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It is a mistake to theorize before one has data. Next. Okay, so Harvard says, I have the sexiest job. This is a, a quote from the Harvard Business Review. A data scientist, the sexiest job of the 20th century. So that's me. Um, next. Um, so what does um, a data scientist do? What does someone like me do? First, it's an interdisciplinary approach. So we use a lot of the techniques, some of which are um, you must know your domain. You must have domain expertise. You use math, statistics, visualization techniques, graph analytics, and so on. So essentially, we use all these scientific methods algorithms, subject matter expertise to try and extract knowledge from data and explain the phenomenon that you're trying to uh, address. Next, please. So you are familiar with truth in an informal way in, in, um, in terms of ethics, philosophy, religion. You read about it in the Bible. And in math, we, there's a concept of absolute truth. We use proofs like reductio ad absurdum or a, an example of which is proof by contradiction to establish the absolute truth. However, this notion of absolute truth does not exist in data science, particularly when applied to medical research. Why is that? Why? Because in medical research, it's based on observable properties of the phenomenon, something you measure. You must have heard the term evidence-based. And what you measure and what you observe today may be different in a different data set or at a different point in time. Also, if you subscribe to the notion of absolute truth, right, it violates the scientific method because you're bringing in preconceived notions and biases. Lastly, the truth in scientific method is relative to the context of the model. And there can be different pathways or different models in which to approach your problem. Next, please. So one method of scientific research that I want to talk about is hypothesis testing. And there's a quote there from Edward Teller that I like. So a fact is a simple statement that everyone believes, right? If innocent, it is innocent until found guilty. With a hypothesis, it's guilty until you found effective. So you begin with a hypothesis, right? You ask yourself an interesting question, you begin with a hypothesis, you make some assumptions, and then you create tests to test those assumptions. And you build models, and then how confident are you that the result is not due to chance? And once you're confident, you stick to your hypotheses, otherwise you revert to the alternate hypotheses. And you accept or reject the initial assumption in favor of the alternate position, and then you go on and try and expand your hypotheses to other data sets to generalize. So here was, I have done several projects, one of which was, my hypothesis was that if I, I can predict a particular kind of fraud committed by prescribers or physicians, a particular kind of prescription fraud, solely in looking at data sets that have certain data elements. These data elements have to do with the distance the person traveled, certain combinations of drugs, and so on. So that was my hypothesis. And the first thing I did was to go and seek data that would be suitable to test my hypotheses, one of which was the PDMP. Prescription Drug Monitoring Programs, all the states have them. They are uh, prescriptions. Uh, reported by pharmacies um, once a controlled substance is filled, so an oxycodone or hydrocodone or benzo and so, benzodiazepine and so on. Next, please. 
So here is, once I have my hypotheses, I, I seek the appropriate data, and this is an industry standard for data mining. It's called the CRISP, Cross Industry Standard Process for Data Mining. And the first step is understanding your data well. You really need to spend a lot of time understanding your data well, um, do the data quality assess assessment, and then the next stage is preparation, removing duplicates and um, spurious data, missing values, and so on. The part that I would say I spent the most time on is on modeling. So there's several different techniques there, but I used um, something uh, predictive machine learning methods, uh, examples of which are support vector machines. You all must have heard of um, artificial neural networks random forests and so on. And that's a cyclical process. So you try certain, essentially you're trying to predict something. So in this case, I'm trying to predict who the bad doctors are. And so you, you try different uh, features to feed into your model, and then if that doesn't work out, you come back and change your features and so on. So it's a cyclical pro process, and then the end is evaluation and validation. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just going to show the next three slides and then I'll end after that. I'm going to show you some examples of exploration. So before I get into um, the modeling and the machine learning, I did some exploration on the data and visualization. Histogram, you all are familiar with histograms. Uh, it's a basic concept. So in this chart here, I have male children on the upper graph and females on the lower one. And I'm just doing an age gender histogram on the prescriptions that were filled. Remember, these are all controlled substance prescriptions. What do you see, what, uh, it, since the audience is small enough, it's okay for you to shout out, what do you see that's different in the two graphs? There's a spike in the 2000 Correct. So on, on, the, on the right side, um, uh, sorry, your name is? Uh, yeah. yeah. As she pointed out, um, the difference mainly is in children under the age of 10 years. Right? And so it's worth exploring it. And a histogram is something that's very simple to do and you should always do your basic uni and bivariate statistics in the beginning. So I look at it and then I see that most of the drugs, almost all the drugs were ADHD drugs, Ritalin and Adderall. And you look up literature and you research it and you find that um, there is a two point something um, times greater prevalence of that diagnosis in male children than female children. So at this point, a lot of data scientists would have said, well, that explains it, you know, there's a, that's a roughly 2.5 times more, there's a 2.5 times um, greater prevalence of ADHD, and that explains it. But something in me wanted to delve further, so I looked further. And, and I think this, this is the point that I'm trying to make, is don't just look for the obvious explanation. It's worth it to spend a little bit more time and delve further. So I looked further and I found, Actually, most of these uh, prescriptions were filled by a pharmacy in a different state, more than 100 miles away. And there were several pharmacies much closer. And without um, revealing much uh, more, let, let's just say that this led to um, a, a, a case. Um, next slide, please. So here I am, before I'm getting into complex machine learning models or doing any artificial intelligence applications, this is me just still trying to get a feel for the data. So essentially after I did the data quality assessment, you look for distributions. You look to see if your data is Gaussian because certain models require certain um, distributions. And in this case, I'm just hypothesizing and, and, and doing certain visualizations. So the, the upper right one, I am doing clustering. So what clustering is, it's a method of unsupervised machine learning where what is the data saying about itself? You have no bias, no prior knowledge of the data. Can, if I'm trying to make two classes, for example, it's called a binary classifier, two classes, bad guys, good guys, for example. That's the simplest classifier. Can the data distribute itself into two groups? And I'm not saying which one's bad and which one's good, but this is just the data. So I'm here I am trying to um, classify the people based on who did multiple drugs at the same time. So not one drug in January and for 30 days and then another one in August, but overlaps. And overlaps across different pharmacological groups. And do you guys see the neat clustering into two groups? That's promising. And so that tells me this is uh, uh, an input that I should use in my input vector when I do machine learning. So this is a neatly, neat, neatly separable data. Here, this is another, another hypothesis I have. 
So in this case, I'm looking for these dots are all prescribers or doctors, red and blue. The red ones are the ones that prescribe a certain combination of drugs for which there is no medical legitimacy. By that I mean there are certain combinations of drugs which no doctor would ever give. Why? Because it leads to 12 or more times greater chance of respiratory depression, coma, or even death. And so I hypothesized that most of those guys who did this particular combination of drugs, there was cash payments involved in them. That's just a hypothesis, right? That's just, that's just guess. Sometimes hypotheses are based on some, some sort of expert knowledge, and sometimes it's just your hunch and worth trying out. So I wanted to show you here, so the blue dots and, and the red. Do you see, um, so was my hypothesis correct? Or wrong. What do you see? What do you see from that graph? Okay. So I'll give you the answer. It's, you could more or less say that it's kind of a linear along the 45 degree line, right? And so here I have Medicare payments, and here I have cash. So my hypothesis was that people who um, patients who went to doctors who gave the sort of combination that's a no-no. Um, had some sort of cash payments mixed in to go under the radar, and. I would say that's not an entirely true hypothesis, right? Because it's, it, it, it's along the 45 degree line. However, there is something happening because it's below this, this vertical line here. Um, most of the people who did that also had a lot of prescriptions. This is a logarithmic scale, so had a lot of prescriptions. So these are examples of visualizing the data. Next, please. So here's a, a technique called geospatial or heat maps or hotspots. You must have seen this all the time. This is the map of Indiana because that's where I got the data. And this is normalized by livable land area and by population. Because if you don't normalize the population, Indianapolis in the center will always turn out bright red because there's lots of people there. So you have to normalize by population. And ZCTA for the most part is the same as the US postal zip code. Postal service construct is more or less the same thing. Um, zip code tabulation area, ZCTA, but I take ZCTA because then it gives me access to other demographic information. So I can tie in the zip codes or the ZCTAs with income, overdose deaths, um, education, and so on. So I can do that. And so here, this is a heat map on a particular drug called Opana. So I did heat maps on many different drugs, the top 10 drugs. I did them on polypharmacy, combinations of drugs, and also overlaid with other um, um, data sets from CDC and other places. So what st sticks out here, the, the, red, the red areas, Hartford City and Scott, Scott's, Scottsburg, this is, you know, I, I, I don't really live in Indiana, so I give it to the Health and Human Services and the Health Commissioner from Indiana and ask them to look into it. And we don't have any plausible explanation for why, for why this is red, these you know, largely rural areas, and no one knows what's going on. So guess what? Two months after I gave the, the state of Indiana this chart, there was a huge HIV epidemic that broke out in Scotts County. It was a relatively large percent of the population had HIV. It was in 2014. And the CDC and the federal government had to intervene and give aid and so on. And at the conclusion of the investigation, it turned out that the HIV epidemic could be attributed to people sharing needles from a panna. So here's a technique that's validated, kind of. So this is my kind of truth. Um, it's validated because there's a hot map, a heat map that said, you know, explore this region further. And states typically have limited resources. So you, if you, not in this particular example, but other examples, for example, if you want to see where law enforcement queries should be, Police could decide where to place the drug diversion officers in, uh, along the heat maps. You could focus your education outreach programs in the, in the, the red spot areas and so on. Next, please. So in conclusion, firstly, you can't do really good research unless you're really passionate about the topic. So pick a topic that, that, that really speaks to you that you're passionate about. Make observations, ask interesting questions. Formulate your hypotheses and develop the predictions that you can test, gather the correct data, test your predictions, accept or reject your hypotheses, and if you accept it, then see if you can generalize it and validate it with other data sets. For further reading, may I suggest reading about the Simpsons Paradox, the UC Berkeley gender bias study, 
Um, are, how many of you are familiar with it? Good. And then the, the man in the cave allegory from Plato's The Republic. Thank you for having me.